Okay, and... But don't get started with that, so let me first introduce you. So, good afternoon. Um, curious to learn how was a midterm exam? No, you don't care, or? It's okay. It's okay, so you have can-do attitude? <laughs> okay, I cannot tell you that because I got the envelope this morning, so it's going to take a, well, let me say, I say, I give you a promise that the results will be available on Monday, so next Monday. Oh, next see. Monday. I next thought Monday. Monday is it. Yeah, next Monday you will see how it's going to be. So, um, uh, also I emailed to you regarding the few practical matters. So the first practical matter is related to midterm exam, because some of you were not able to take the, the exam on Tuesday, last Tuesday. So there's going to be another opportunity on Friday, this Friday, at 2 p.m. And it will be one of the lecture rooms closed to, in a building number six. But you need to do the prior registration. This is going to be an unofficial way to do the midterm exam. So you need to let me know if you plan to participate. Now, I'm thinking that, you, that your thoughts are as follows. That, you know, I wasn't scoring very high in the original exam, so let me redo it. Now, where, how it goes this time is that the lowest grade will be accounted. Not the highest, but the lowest. So don't do it, because it makes no sense. So, uh, so there is no way to improve your grade, because this is a special organization, and that is the reason behind it. Then another note is that on 21st, there will be a seminar organized by a company that is, a, is a closely related to ANSYS software. And they're going to explain about fluid dynamics, some uh, mechanical issues related to how to use a finite term method in challenging applications. This is something that I highly recommend you to participate. There's going to be a seminar, and after seminar, there's like, you know, an official party. An official party will be organized in a street cafe. I believe that they're going to provide some alcohol too. So that's, uh, so think about this opportunity. It's not happened that frequently. But you need to register before the meeting, so please do that. And the link to do so, that's in my message. Now, finally, now you know that we're going to have a number of uh, visiting lectures in this period. So the first visiting lecture is uh, related to bicycle dynamics, and this will be delivered by Arden Swap. He's been my friend since a okay, uh, long time, so we met. <laughs> no, no, not that. It's not. It's not, it's not hundred years ago, but uh, we've been knowing each other quite a while, and that's because we both in a multi-body community. A multi-body community is somewhat small community, so you easily get to know all the active members in the community. So we knew each other already quite a while. Some, what I would say, fifteen years ago, you started to look like what's the deal with the bicycles and the bicycle dynamics. And you've been active in this field since that. Right. What is the bicycle dynamics and how that is related to everyday life? That's what we're going to learn next. So, Adam, please. Thank you, Aki. Well, first of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, address uh, your students here. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be here and to talk a little bit about uh, bicycle dynamics. Uh, my name is Arend Schwab. I'm from uh, Delft University of Technology, where I run the bike lab. Uh, I'm in the biomechanical department, but that's just uh, some department. My background is theoretical and applied mechanics. And one, one of the problems is uh, bicycle dynamics. Uh, the motto of the talk of today is actually that, uh, well, everybody knows how a bicycle is constructed, right? Uh, two wheels and a steering assembly, th that's it. But uh, very few really understand the operation. And with the operation, I not only mean that you propel yourself, but also, how do you steer, how do you balance the thing? How does it work? Um, because, well, first of all, the work I present here, uh, I could not have done that by myself. Uh, the, the beautiful thing of academia is that you collaborate with colleagues, and, and here are just a bunch of names, uh, some from Delft, uh, the list goes, of course, on and on. Uh, from Cornell, uh, Andy Ruina, he was my host 15 years ago during a sabbatical. And uh, during the, uh, the fall break, he had to write an NSF proposal, and I had to babysit him. Uh, we academics, we usually babysit each other. And then um, 
so he was sitting, and I was sitting there. I mean, what do you do when you babysit? Yeah, you look at your baby and say, hey, work. But for the rest, uh, so I said to Andy, what, what shall I do? I said, well, you're from Holland. You know about bicycles. We have this research which has very strange results. And why, why don't you look into it? Hey, you, you know everything about bikes. I said, well, I don't know. I can ride a bike. But... And actually, that, that, that kicked off a whole uh, can of worms, a whole research line on bicycle dynamics and control. Two major publications which are freely available. One is a linearized dynamics equation for, for, for a balance and steer of a bicycle. That's in the Proceeding of the Royal Society. And we are among good authors there because uh, Sir Isaac Newton also published in that journal. And then secondly, there was a building block for 2011 in science. For why does a bicycle stay upright? What does it need for, for this, this balance? Okay, some observations. Um, this is a movie nobody in the audience has seen. It's an old one. It's Jacques Tati, Jour de Fête, and it's a postman who wants to rationalize and he wants to do it on the bike, and then everything goes faster. You see a bike moving by itself, and then since it's a movie, everybody thought, ah, it's a trick. Uh, everything in the movie is a trick, so this is a trick too. Well, it turns out that this is not a trick. So even if you see this bike going by itself around the corner, of course, there's a little bit of a slope, but the thing is not falling over. So that is kind of the magical thing in bikes. Well, it turns out it's not a movie trick. Any bike can do that. You go to the car park, you take your bike, you give it some speed, and you see the thing will stay upright. And uh, in technical terms, we call this stable. But I always say, well, a bike is super stable. Because not, you can even hit it sideways, it starts oscillating, and the oscillation dies out. So, very stable system, given some forward speed. At zero speed, bang, it falls over. Given some speed, it stays upright. Now, the bike in itself is very old. Uh, it started around uh, 1820 uh, with uh, Carl von Dreis with a hobby horse. And, um, and then you had to propel with your feet eh, on the ground. That, that was the way to go. But Humans have something in their genes, some, some special sequence in their genes, and that sequence tells you faster. So with everything you do, it always tells you, yes, but I want to go faster. And that gene was also here, and so what people did, they said, well, I want to go faster. Well, then you mount pedals on the front wheel. No, but I want to go faster. Well, then you just make the front wheel bigger. Uh, yeah, well, here you have some restriction. Apparently it has to do something with your legs, your length. Yeah, but I want to go faster. Well, and then suddenly you see a jump. Somebody comes with a solution where he says, well, I do a chain drive with a gear ratio. And then I can change the, the, the gear ratio and I go faster. But you see it's evolution because we still have the big wheel, front wheel. And then again somebody says, well, that was sort of stupid. You can also have a small front wheel. Doesn't matter. And then slowly we come 1890, eh, the safety bicycle. Uh, and the hallmark of the safety bicycle is actually two equal size wheels with pneumatic tires and a chain drive. And this bike is probably the same bike you are riding now. So from 1890 until now, nothing changed. Why? Well, it's kind of an evolutionary process and it's, it's sort of okay. Eh? For everyday use, it's, it's okay. So around that time, it is 1890, uh, other sci scientists of course wondered why does a bike stay upright? And uh, Whipple, uh, Francis Whipple from the UK and Carvalho from France, they independently of each other made a model. And a, a very simple model of course, hey, rigid bodies, fixed rider, no hands operation, everything symmetric, idealized contact, no propulsion. And then that it comes down that that model only has three degrees of freedom. So the thing can move back and forth. You can lean left and right and you can steer. Those are the three degrees of freedom in that system. And the idea is, well, can this very simplistic bicycle, can this already predict this self-stability? Now, the, the bike in itself has three degrees of freedom, but the number of parameters of the bike is a lot bigger. You have like 25 parameters, like the wheelbase, the tilt of the steering axis, the mass and the mass distribution, uh, uh, the, the trail, how far is the contact point behind the steering axis. So this whole table shows these 25 parameters, meaning that the whole family of bicycles is large. With those 25 parameters, you can make all kinds of strange bicycles. Yeah. 
To investigate the stability of the motion, uh, we look at the linearized equations of motion. And that's, of course, uh, super simple because uh, it's just what did Newton say? Uh, if you want to change the velocity, you have to apply a force, right? So force is mass times change of velocity, which we tend to call acceleration. So force is mass times acceleration. And, well, we have three degrees of freedom, so they are coupled in some way. And uh, after some elaborate work, you come to the conclusion that these are the, the linearized equations of motion. In nothing like, nothing more or less like mass times acceleration is forces. And those forces you can here write as a function of small angles, eh? uh, small changes from the upright position, and, and velocities. Now, it's three equations because the third equation is rather boring. For the linearized equation of motion, it tells you the forward speed is constant, eh? v dot is zero. And then the lean and the steer is coupled in this set of second order differential equations. We showed explicitly the dependency of speed because that's an important thing. Eh? We know already from experience at zero speed the thing is falling over. Given some speed, it's stable. So we want to use that forward speed as a parameter. And if we parameterize everything with that forward speed, we see a sort of a damping term linear in that forward speed. And we see a stiffness term, of course, gravitational stiffness, eh? very unstable because it's falling over. But there's also a quadratic contribution. And that has to do that when you go in circles, there are also eh, forces, or so when you are turning. Anyway, we're going to investigate the stability. We assume exponential motions. We get a characteristic equation. It's, since it's decoupled, we have two second-order equations, so we get four eigenvalues for the whole problem. So a fourth-order polynomial. And we are uh, interested in stability as function of forward speed. So for stability, we calculate the eigenvalues. If they're positive, the thing is unstable. If they're negative, the thing is stable. And we see here that from a certain speed on, these eigenvalues are all have a negative real part. So this very simplistic model already predicts that a bicycle can be self-stable given a forward speed. And it's also realistic. Eh? It starts from a speed of five meters per second or something like that. Okay, uh, but how good is it? It's linearized equation of motion. So we take the full nonlinear model, first at unstable speed, and then what happens is yeah, you fall over. And this is actually what happens when you learn to ride a bike, right? Because it's scary and you don't go so fast, and if you don't go so fast, you're not stable, so you will fall over. So the only way is to go a little bit faster. Here again, for the uh, this is like the, the experiment in the car park where I started. You propel the bike, you hit it sideways, and you see an oscillation, and the oscillation finally dies out. Eh? The thing is again upright again. So very stable system. Okay. Remains the question, of course. Where does this bicycle self-stability come from? Uh, what does it take for, how does a bike become self-stable? What, what does it take? What do you need? Uh, that is a very hard question. Now, let's do a simpler one, is how do we balance a bike? Uh, we all can ride a bike and we all know, oh yeah, what we are doing when we are balancing. So, what are you doing when you balance a bike? Adjust what? The? Adjust, adjust the oh, yeah, you, you lean with your upper body. Do you do something with your steering or? Yeah, what do you do exactly? Try to keep it forward, keep steering going forward. So, for instance, you, you you tend to fall over to the left, then what do you do? Turn to the right. Okay. Well, anyway, the, the balancing, the upper body, the steering stuff, and so on. So you say, if I fall to the left, or you steer to the right. Eh? Um, well, it turns out that's not the case. Although we all can ride a bike, and we all have an idea about what's going on, it turns out that that is not, not what is really going on. So the question of answering how do we balance a bike, that is disputed. So let's take an even simpler problem. And a simple problem is, well, imagine this is the bike, right? And the bike is falling over. So what do I do? Well, the bike is falling to the, uh, to the right. Then I move my hand to the right to get the contact point underneath, right? 
That's the way how to balance a stick. So again, I can balance it by, if it falls over, I move the contact point. And if it falls like this, I move the contact point. Okay, now back to the bike. How am I going to do that in the bike? Well, if I want to move the contact points in the bike, I have to take earth and move the earth, right? Now, it turns out that if you have a lot of people, then maybe you can do it, but it's not so efficient. So, but there is a pure, a, a super pure nice mechanism on the bike, and that is your steering assembly. If the bike is moving forward, and you turn your handlebars, your contact points will go sideways, right? So if you move forward and you steer to the left, your contact points will move to the left. And if your bike is moving forward and you steer to the right, your contact points will move to the right. So with your steering assembly, you're able to move your contact points. Now I get back to you and I say, okay, I fall to the left. Then my balancing tells me, oh, I have to move my contact points to the left, so I have to steer to the left. And, and, and this is a clear proof that, and that sounds very counterintuitive, right? Like if you fall like here, oh, you start steering, huh? wrong, because you will fall over even more if you steer to the right, if you fall to the left. So, but apparently, uh, we are able to learn those things, not, not by reading. Eh? It's not that you buy a bike and uh, in the books say, well, mount a bike, yeah, okay, start pedaling, okie dokie. Uh, I fall to the left, I steer to the left. Okay, I get that, easy. That's not how it works. For some reason, we have to get that into our brain in our whole control system. Okay, proof of principle. Uh, we have students also at Delft, and they have to do projects. One of the projects is Megatronics. And some years ago, we were using Lego Mindstorms, and they were usually building a robot. Uh, Lego Mi is somebody familiar with Lego Mindstorms here? Okay, it's, it's fun stuff. It's Legos, I, I love that. And it has motors, sensors, and a computer. And usually they build a robot, but uh, Joop Mutsars, he, uh, he was an enthusiastic motorcycle rider. And <clears throat> he uh, thought, well, I'm going to show off and I'm going to build a motorbike. So he built this thing, uh, one motor for steering, one motor for propulsion, a sensor for forward that the thing is falling over, and a computer. And since he was a, a motorcycle rider, he, he, he had the idea, oh, yeah, I know how to, how to balance this thing, that's no problem. So he made a computer code, a whole control scheme, like if you're going like this fast and the steering angle is like that, and then you do a control like uh, this on the steer motor, and then whatever he did, bang, bang. The thing was always falling over. And he was getting nervous because he had an internship after this in Switzerland, and the, 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 the plane ticket was already booked. Um, so what to do? And then somebody said, well, there in the back of the lab, there's the bike lab, uh, Schwab, and he, he knows a bit about balance, I guess. So go to him. So Joop came to me and I said, well, actually the problem is pretty simple. You have to steer into the undesired fall. So if the thing is falling to the left, you steer to the left, and if it's falling to the right, you steer to the right. How do you know you're falling? Well, you have this, this lean rate sensor. And then how can you steer? Well, you have this DC motor. So... Yeah, how does it work? The torque on the motor is uh, its a DC motor, so the, the voltage you put on is the amount of torque. So the steer motor voltage should be uh, 10 times the lean rate, or minus 10, or 100, or minus 100. You have to fiddle a little bit with the gain and get your signs right, but then that should work. And then it was very quiet. He looked me in the eye. I said, what's the problem, uh, Joop? Uh, he said, well, it's only one line of code. I said, yes. So he just went away and he came back after 10 minutes with this result. So you see the thing is falling over and it's steering into that direction of fall. Very stable, right? So you have to steer into the undesired fall. And again, in this video you can see it. The bike is falling to the left and then steering to the left. And it's falling to the right and then it's steering to the right. So that's what we also see in reality. Remains the question, of course, how does the bike d do that? It, it, it's like, it sounds like some, some auto-magic control, right? What, what thing in the bike does this steering into the fall? And actually, the question is pretty old. And there's a whole family this, who, of, of scientists who say, no, it has to do with the gyroscopic effect. Uh, gyros the front wheel is like a gyroscope, so gyroscope is a thing in 3D. 
uh, if you have a wheel which rotates like this, so about this axis, and then you tilt it about the second axis, like this, you get about the third axis, you get a torque. So it's one, two, three. That's how uh, gyros work. And then if you look at the signs, the signs are correct. So if the wheel is doing like this, and it's tilting like that, then there's a torque like that. So, okay. But if you do the calculation, the torque is up 0.13 uh, newton meters, a very small number. So you say, hmm, is that going to work? No, people say it's about the strange geometry of the front assembly. It has to do with the, the, the contact point being behind the steering axis. So this is the steering axis, and if you elongate and it hits the ground here, then the contact point is behind. And that's the same like in these uh, shopping carts, and well, under this desk there are these caster wheels, like, uh, which you have in a shopping cart or a desk chair. Or These caster wheels, there you have a caster wheel, and there, they, they, they follow you. Wherever you go, uh, the caster wheel will follow you. So that makes the thing stable. Well, if you uh, go to the first uh, uh, bunch of people, around 1910, there were two uh, scientists, Felix Klein and Arnold Sommerfeld, and I always call them half-gods. They live up there somewhere. Uh, Arnold Sommerfeld, 81 times nominated for the uh, Nobel Prize. So, uh, uh, They wrote um, a book on uh, Theorie des Kreisels, so uh, Theory of Gyroscopes. And of course, uh, it's a four-volume book. It's about this size in your, your, on your bookshelf. And the fourth part, uh, Frederick, uh, Fritz Neuter uh, contributed to that, is about uh, bicycles, because when you do research in gyros, you see gyros everywhere, right? So you see a bike, you say, oh, there's a gyro. And then um, they said, well, let's, they knew their classics, so they knew that uh, this Whipple and Carvalho had done that uh, model, and they said, well, we will show from the whipple Carvalho model that if you leave out the gyroscope, uh, which Whipple didn't look at, then, then stability will be lost. And, and they, they, they say it's small, but it's, but it's indispensable for stability. And uh, well, same statement. And then uh, they go again to the derivation, and then they, they separate it with gyro and non-gyro terms, and they say, well, if we cancel all these terms, then it's okay. You see, it's, then it can never be stable. Well, unfortunately, they made two sign errors in their thing. So what had to be a minus was a plus, and if you now cancel the terms, it's not so obvious that stability is lost. So this is one theory. What is that book series? Uh, four volumes? Yes. So how many pages is it all that? Well, uh, every volume is like 500 pages. So how about the titles? Okay. Yeah, how only about Java. Yeah, very thorough, very... Sometimes there's a sign error, so be aware if you read the book. But, well, the, 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 uh, we're laughing at it, but it's only very unfortunate, because after 1910, everybody was repeating that. Like, oh, the bike, yeah, he's self-stable because of the gyro. No, not necessarily. Okay, then the other guys who are saying, well, it has to do with this front assembly, right, the contact point behind. Well, there was Jones in the 1970s from uh, Cambridge, UK, and uh, he knew his classics, so he knew uh, Whipple and Cavalier, and he knew Klein and Sommerfeld, and he mounted a counter-rotating wheel on the front assembly to kill the whole gyro effect. Eh? You have one angular momentum this way, the other angular momentum that way. It's in one frame, so it's a zero angular momentum. And yes, mommy, I can even write without hands. Eh? So you don't need that. Uh, and then he said, well, but now if I change the trail, and it's, it's, so if, if you flip the fork, then the trail is very large, eh? the contact point is very far behind the steering axis, and here you made a contraption such that the, f the contact point is in front of the steering axis. The moment the contact point becomes in front of the steering axis, he, he, it's hard to control, you cannot ride without hands, so that was the thing, this is the, the, the stability thing in the bike. And then he went to, into an analysis with potential energy to show that for, for positive it's stable and for negative trail it's unstable. Very nice reasoning and everybody copied it. But unfortunately, potential energy for a stationary bike is the same as the potential energy for a moving bike. Speed doesn't matter there, right? And we've seen that it's speed dependent, the stability. And if we then correct this whole reasoning with a dynamic term, again, it's not clear if positive trail is necessary for stability. 
remains the question, what does it take to make the bike self-stable? Well, the answer is actually super simple. You take all these equations of motion, uh, these two coupled equations of motion, which are in itself functions of the 25 bicycle parameters. Then you express the stability by doing the characteristic equation. Then you have the Ruth Hurwitz stability criteria, which are six criteria, which all have to be positive. And if you write that out in the 25 parameters and you print that, then you can paint all the walls of this building. So that's undoable. You cannot get any, uh, you, my maple TA doesn't work. So that's too complex. So what do we do? We make the bike simpler and simpler and simpler, such that it still has this self-stability, but it lacks all these, these so-called necessary terms. So we, we kill the gyro, we put it on skates. Uh, we kill the trail, we put the steering axis exactly at the contact point. And then we make a very simple mass distribution, and then we have eight parameters left. And they, they have to do with where are the masses and what is the tilting. And then we can prove, theoretically, for this machine, that from a certain speed on, the thing is always self-stable. So, again, the model predicts it, but it's linearized equations of motion. You could say it's only about small numbers or the basin of attraction is small. So we do a full nonlinear analysis, and then we see, yeah, the thing, like hey, the, the bike in the car park, the thing stays upright. Okay, promising, so we built this machine. Um, of course, uh, you need some material. Hey, it, it cannot really be two-point masses, but you try to make it light. Uh, we, do, we could have put it on skates. We're pretty good at skating in the Netherlands, but for doing the measurements, that's not so easy. So we do a counter-rotating wheel on top of the normal wheel and, and we have like 99.5% gyro-free, so it's almost gyro-free. And then about the contact point, we make the trail negative a little bit, so a little bit in front of the contact, edge, contact um, uh, point because in reality the contact is not a point, it's a region, it's a small, and we want to be that sure that that the contact point, the net contact point, the resulting one, is not behind the steering axis. It must be on or a little bit in front. Anyway, we build the machine, then uh, we go to the, uh, to the gym, we bring it up to speed, we release it, and lo and behold, the thing stays upright. Looks like a miracle, eh? No gyro, no trail, stable. Again, we bring it up to speed, we hit it sideways, thing oscillates and comes back up again. So this is the living proof that a bicycle can be self-stable without gyroscope or caster effect. And that was finally something where we could publish in science and that's what we needed because before that time when I was talking about bicycle dynamics everybody was sort of smiling a little bit like yeah <laughs> nice okay uh, serious business. Uh, uh, do you also do any serious research? So it was very hard to sell. Even get grant money was totally impossible. Nobody was interested. But this put us on the map. Okay, now we, until now we only talked about the machine. But in reality, of course, there's always somebody on the bike and he's controlling the bike. And most of the time you're, you're at slow speed, you're not at the stable speed region, or you want to do a complex maneuver. And the question is, how do we control the bike? How do we do it? It's already mentioned, yeah, you lean with your body, you steer. Sometimes the people are sticking out their feet. Or, eh, uh, Aki on his uh, mountain bike when he comes to university, he does all kind of crazy behavior uh, just to stay upright. Okay, so our big question is, how do we control the mostly unstable bike? Uh, you see two persons here. One of them is very famous, of course, and that is my daughter because I used her to study how do you balance a bike? What does a person do? How can you learn to do that? And of course there are two mechanisms, by steering and by balancing it with your body relative to the bike. Now uh, an intermediate question, to turn to the right. You're cycling, you have some speed and you want to take a right. What do you do? Steer to the right. Yeah. What do you do? Sorry? Yeah? To the left. To the left. Okay. But you want to go to the right, right? Yeah. But you steer the wrong way. Yeah. Okay. 
crazy guys. <laughs> Cannot cycle. <laughs> what do you do? The right, yeah. Do you do something with your upper body? Or can you just stay straight? To the right, you lean to the right. Okay. Well, the crazy guys in the audience are right. If you want to take a turn to the right, the only way to do it is to briefly turn to the left. And then do nothing. And then you will go to the right. And that sounds a bit strange. And if we also look at the, the simulation, then uh, this is real time. So we go forward. I steer to the left and bang, I take a right turn. Now let, let's do that in slow motion. How does it work? Okay. So we move forward. Now the moment we start steering to the left, the contact points move to the left and consequently the bike will fall over to the right and that's exactly what we need. Because how do we lean our bike in a turn? We cannot push against anything. The moment I start moving my upper body, the bike, bike moves the other way and in netto there, there happens nothing. I cannot get the whole system leaning. The total center of mass stays approximately on the vertical. So I cannot move that center of mass, but with my steering assembly I can do it easily. If I want to have my center of mass lean to the right, oh, I steer a little bit to the left, there I go. And I really encourage you to do the experiment, maybe not now when it's so icy, but... Uh, so you, 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 you cycle and you don't hold the handlebars with your hands, but with your open hands you push against your handlebars. And the moment you push a little bit to the right, you, hey, you steer to the left, you see ah, the bike will fall over to the right. And the moment you push the other way, you'll fall, see it will fall over. So that is the basic mechanism for our control. When you uh, ride a bike without using your hands, yeah. then you can still steer yeah. without yeah. stopping the bike. Yeah. You can just yeah. lean. So how do you do that? Well, that, that, again, the mechanism is uh, there is, a, there is, of course, a coupling between leaning and steering in a bike. Eh? If you tilt a bike, it starts steering also. So if you tilt a bike to the left, it starts steering to the left. And if you tilt a bike to the right, it starts steering to the right. So then, when your intention is to take a right turn, then you have to move your body such that the steering will briefly be to the left, and then the thing will move to the right. So what, when you do without hands, the control is indirect. It goes from your upper body motion to the, the rear frame lean angle to the steering angle. And that also explains why it's a little bit harder to control your bike with no hands than with hands. With hands is very direct, with no hands it's a bit indirect. Okay, uh, yeah. how much time do I have, Aki? Until? Well, this is um, the question to you guys. Oh, okay. So you can ask, like, how long do you like to stay here? I usually have three quarters of an hour in mind. And we started at what time did we start? We started at 2.15. Uh, 2.15. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, are you sorry, usually when I do my lecture, we don't communicate. We don't discuss like this. Okay. Can I take one hour for, the, for this presentation? That we stop at a quarter past three? Yeah, because at the end I have some cool sports pro projects which may interest you. Okay, so uh, again, back to rider control, how do we control a bike? And then, well, the first thing in science what you do is observe, right? So we observe how people are operating a bike by mounting a camera on the rear frame looking at the rider. We, we, we stole this from the TV guys, we had to do some uh, TV stuff and then they mounted the camera on the rear frame looking at the rider and then you see all these relative motions of the rider with respect to the frame and you see the steering very nicely. So then we do a ride into town and this is then the image you get. Uh, the world is moving of course. You see the upper body moving, you see some steering going on. And yeah, there are a lot of disturbances in the outside world. So actually it's not so nice to do it in, in the outside world. although. I always say, well, we sh should do it there because that is real cycling, but it's difficult. So what do we do? We go to a, uh, uh, to in Amsterdam they have a treadmill, and it's a very big treadmill, three by five meters. The max speed is 55 kilometers per hour. I cannot cycle that. Uh, you can tilt the whole thing up and down. Beautiful place to experiment. Can you ride on a treadmill? Well, eh, to eat the pudding is to test. So. 
you pick a bike, put a helmet on, you start cycling. And yes, I'm old and I'm clumsy, I fully agree, but I can sort of cycle. But if you look at the video, it looks horrible, right? Like, it, it looks like somebody who has never ridden a bicycle. Uh, so let's, let's look at it again. So, of course, the speed is not so high, so it's not clearly not self-stable, but I should be able to balance. Now, the big problem here is, of course, that your sensory input is conflicting. Uh, there is no optical flow. So from your vision, which is a very strong sensor, your, your vision sensor tells you you're not moving. But you're pedaling and you're steering, so, and the belt is moving, so I'm moving, you're not moving, I'm moving, you're not moving, so, and then bang, the whole system shuts down. And shutting down means you fall over. The trick is, of course, look into infinity, that's one solution, eh? because in infinity things are not really moving so much, or look at your front wheel, because that is rotating. So what we do, we, 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 team, uh, we put uh, a lot of markers, eh? 31 uh, markers, active markers on somebody, put them on a bike, give him some training purpose and then time. And then he cycles like this and then we can reconstruct the recorded data. And from that, of course, from all these numbers which we have, we can extract what are the motions, what is happening. And then we see uh, that uh, the major motion is uh, the bike itself, then pedaling, of course, then we see the flexing of your spine, uh, which is also coupled with pedaling because it's all coupled with the same frequency. Then the uh, head is moving, then finally we see steering, then we see some second order bounce of the knees, because um, in one cycle you push twice, so you have a, like a double uh, frequency bounce. And then we see, that was very surprising, the knees moving in and out. And if we then look at the videos, you see at very low speed, we use our body, but we don't use our upper body, but we use our knees to balance. And and think of, of uh, when you, you cycle in the summer again, that, that sometimes you use your knees. And why, we don't know. So at, at low speed, you have a tendency to use your knees. Also in cornering sometimes. You don't use your upper body, but you use your knee for some reason. And it's all speed dependent, all these different modes. Okay. Now what can you do with this research? It's all very nice and it all... It all answers our, our intellectual question like, oh, how does it work? But is there some application? Is it relevant to society? And uh, my answer is yes, absolutely. Because if we look at seriously injured in traffic, therefore cars and other uh, motor vehicles, there's a tendency to go down with all the years. But for cyclists, it goes up, up, up. And even the, the number of deaths in traffic has the, shows the same trend. And to give you numbers, for this uh, last year, there were uh, in traffic in the Netherlands 600 deaths and 200 out of them were cyclists. And of course you say, yeah, but there are a lot of cyclists in the Netherlands. That's true, but if you look at the numbers about uh, time spent uh, during mobility or, or, or a distance traveled, that number is far too high. That, that there is something wrong. So, uh, and if you look in detail here, it's uh, mainly elderly. Why? Well, because people tend to become older and they, they, they tend to remain cycling even at an older age. But the more interesting thing is that they're not run over by a bike or a truck, by a car or a truck. These cyclists just fall over. Right? It's single vehicle accidents. So it's 75% of these accidents is just bang, falling over. And of course, the unbalance of the bike plays a role there. So we look at that, so we make an active lateral stability control for the bike. Because, well, you've seen the Lego bike, why not do it on a real bike? You can do it. And then you have very little, you need little control to balance the thing. So this is the machine. It has a steer torque motor, it has a, an extra battery, it has some, some, some electronics here to sense it's falling over and to steer the thing. And then uh, you can easily ride it, it feels, feels, feels very nice. Uh, normal human control is only stable here, but he, we operate it here. There's a lot of steering going on. With the shared control, we see it's stable already from a very low speed, self-stable, and there's a lot of less steering going on. It feels a bit different, so 50% of people say, oh, what a quickie bike, it's doing all kinds of things. And the other half said, oh, that's pretty nice, pretty nice stable platform. So the human, human acceptance side is still a problem. Uh, in this one, there's a mechanical connection, but we also have a 
Now we also have a steer by wire bike where there's uh, nothing in between the handlebars and the steering assembly, just like in the plane, right? In an airplane, it's an electronic collect connection. And that's even crazier because then you can do all kinds of tricks. You can make a, that there are no forces on the, you feel no forces on the handlebars, like Mickey Mouse steering. So the, the angle you give is the angle you get there, but the forces from the front assembly, you don't feel them. Very hard to ride that bike. You can make it if you steer left and the, the wheel goes right and uh, all kinds of crazy things. We use it actually as an experimental platform to change the dynamics on the bike so we can do system identification of the rider control. But I didn't want to talk about it now. E-bikes and elderly. I don't know how it's here in Finland, but in the Netherlands there's an enormous uprise of e-bikes and uh, uh, on these e-bikes you see a lot of elderly. And uh, when you are at the, at the party and you're talking uh, small talk, they always say, oh, these old people on the e-bike, they're so dangerous. They go so fast and that's really dangerous. Well, actually the bottom line of the story is of course that somebody on a bike passes them and then, wow, he's older than I am. What the heck is going on? Yeah, he's riding an e-bike. So it's, but the big thing is of course, they think that elderly on an e-bike go too fast and that's dangerous. So we, what do we do? We investigate, we have two bikes, an uh, e-bike and a normal bike, almost identical. Then we have uh, two groups, uh, middle age and older age, and we do all this research by finding out how do they behave. Well, the bottom line is that E-bikes on an uh, elderly on an e-bike go as fast as middle-aged on a normal bike. And that's good. Because they go with the flow, there's nothing. And they have no attention deficit, everything works. The problem with e-bikes is slow speed. Mounting and dismounting, doing shoulder checks, sticking out their hand. That is the problem and that's where most of the accidents also occur. That's what we guess because there's not so much registration of accidents. In, in cyclists, and that has to do with insurance and vehicle and so on, and that's very unfortunate. Yeah? So e-bikes, elderly on e-bike, very safe. Next thing is, um, this is like my love baby, the bicycle simulator. I like to do a lot of experiments where the ethical commission says, no go, too dangerous. So we cannot do it with human subjects on the open road. However, if you have a validated bicycle simulator, then you can do the experiments in a safe environment there. But not only the, the dangerous experiments, but you can also do, you can use it as a training tool to train people's balance, or you can use it as a training tool to how good am I still in traffic eh, for elderly on the bike. Because now when an elderly asks his MD for like, uh, after an operation or whatever, can I still cycle? Then he looks at you and he says, oh, yeah, I guess so. But we have here an instrument where we can assess the person, eh, either in controlling the vehicle or and or in, in being in traffic. Uh, you can hook up more simulators in one virtual world, eh, car simulator, bicycle simulator, see what the interactions are. So there is a plethora of applications. Of course, the underlying is again the bicycle model. Very important is what we discovered, the forces you feel on the handlebar. So we made sure that you feel the right forces. It's still stationary. We're going to move it on a, a steward platform, which is somewhere here in the lab, but that's, that's future work. We're busy on that. And this is how it operates. Of course, uh, we have the Oculus uh, with a complete virtual environment and, uh, and you can cycle. Since it's stationary, it's a bit quirky yet. Still, uh, you don't feel that you're, you're leaning, and but you are leaning and so you get a little bit upset in your stomach. And But on the other hand, if you if you, for instance, in this virtual world cycle up a hill, you really feel in your stomach you're going up a hill, whereas nothing is happening. Yeah? Physically, nothing is happening. So we're pretty busy with this. Then, of course, we have this human power challenge. Uh, we advise on that. What is the challenge? Well, take a bike and go as fast as you can. That's the whole challenge. And you, you can have a fairing, so, but it's just a person in here pedaling. And uh, this is then the team, and uh, this is then the... In 2013 we were able to do this speed record, 133 point, just by human power, just by pedaling flat road. So that was fun. Um, then we worked together with professional Tour de France team, we worked together with the Sunweb team, uh, Tom de Moulin. Uh, 
One of the projects is descending technique. Why is that important? Well, you can lose a race by descending, right? In descending. So descending technique is, is important. Then when you ask what is the best descending technique, they say, follow the guy. Do what he does. And that, that's very poor. So we said, well, let's observe. Let's see what's going on. Eh? So we, we take a bike, we put all kind of measurement stuff on it to measure what is the lean angle, what is the steer angle, uh, relative angle to the bike. What is he looking at? How fast is he going? Where is he riding on the road? And then, um, well, descending is scary. Uh, this is a one kilometer descent and it takes one minute, so you can guess how fast it goes approximately. Um, are there any cyclists here, uh, sportive cyclists here in the audience? Yeah, it's sort of, it's scary, right, going downhill. It's, uh, it's, yeah, you need some technique. Well, here you see uh, there is sound, but not through the microphone it doesn't work, but it's a lot of sound and noise. He had to stay on the right side of the road because traffic was coming up. Was still, we didn't, couldn't close the road. Um, well, this is still pretty okay. Then uh, the next corner, he comes up again, eh? sort of an air break, uh, because he doesn't want to break so much. And then this one, he speeds up again. That's a shallow corner going faster, 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 and then at the end there's really a much sharper corner and there's the ravine, like, uh, but for some reason uh, they can do it, right? And some are faster than others. And here we, as a baseline, we have the winner, that's this color, I have no idea what it is, but the uh, baseline is zero, and then all the other riders are in relative to this baseline. And then you see that the, the winner in the beginning is even not so good, some are even faster. And then again, if you look where things are happening, then it's mostly at corners. So then if we focus on, on what's happening in the corner and then we focus on the break uh, strategy, we see that the winner has a totally different break strategy. He breaks fast at the beginning, uh, uh, hard at the beginning and, and a little bit in the corner and that, that's it. And, and, and then of course you can, uh, even on a scrap of paper, you can see, oh yeah, that's actually a good strategy to uh, not, not have a lot of braking during the cornering, but just right before the corner, brake hard and then go again. The other thing we are doing is optimal time trial. Uh, for the last Tour de France, there was for the first time a team time trial. And in a team time trial, you have a lot of opportunities. Uh, in an in a, in a individual time trial, you just have to cycle uh, as fast as you can. But in a team time trial, you have the opportunities because um, you can change position, so you can go to the back, fall to the back, and then uh, he has to do less power than the front, and after a while the front is tired and he falls back again, and well, wh what is the, the, optimal, the optimal configuration in to, to do that? Because every rider is different, eh? the amount of power they can deliver, and the size of every, every rider is also different. So it, it looks like a real optimal control thing. Um, we have the front one has a lot of drag and that reduces quickly when you go to the back. The graphs like this, 100% for the front and it goes back to, uh, to something like 65% for the one in the position 4 or 5. Real, uh, and then the, the power model, uh, you, you, can, you can have a critical power which you can maintain forever, but you have kind of a sort of a battery so you can go a little bit above that critical power but then the battery is depleted and it has to be recharged again. So, and then the position, yeah, you can go back to the back or you can stitch in somewhere in the middle. A lot of ways to do it. So the nice optimal control problem, which you can beforehand then program and calculate. And so we came up with schemes like, okay, uh, first minute, uh, number one is at the head and then he goes to between two and three and, and five drops down to six and five back and very complex scheme. And then they said, we're not gonna do that. That's far too complex. The only way we can communicate is by radio and everybody hears it and we don't know where they are. And, but a bit tuned down scheme was used and I don't know if you remember, but this year, uh, this last Tour de France, the Sunweb team was second in the team time trial and nobody expected that because of an intelligent way to do the team time trial. I'll skip the video. Then uh, for the uh, Olympic 2020, we have a, a, a track bicycle team and uh, they are currently uh, riding on uh, uh, Koga Miata bicycles, these, these, these bikes. 
and then the Kogabayata and the, the Dutch uh, Olympic uh, team and the uh, NSF, the Dutch uh, Sports uh, Association, they decided that uh, we want new bikes. And then you say, uh, why do you want new bikes? They say, because we want new bikes. So it's totally unclear, but they wanted to have new track bicycles. So uh, a consortium was formed, COGA, TU Delft, uh, Pontus for the constructive, ActiFlow for the uh, CFD calculations. And with this team, we designed a new track bicycle for Tokyo 2020. Uh, and Delft, eh, so in my case, uh, I was, we were responsible for uh, yeah, handling, stability, eh, those kind of things. How the, the, does the bike handle very well? Can the rider deliver his power? Is the steering not too nervous? Um, if we again first observe, and here you see that the elbow is pretty close to the knee here, right? Here it's okay, but here, a bit of a strange posture on the bike. Uh, moreover, this, this, this doesn't look good, right? If you have to do some way to get your knee out of your elbow, or, or the bottom line is all bikes Current bikes are too small. They, they, all the riders, they just don't fit the bike. And then when you think about that, then that trend came because everybody was thinking, oh, we need a light bike and, and oh, let's make it a bit shorter within the rules. And, but in the end, they ended up with bikes which didn't fit them. So the first thing we did was we, we measured all these riders, uh, the anthropomorphic sizes, uh, arm length and leg length and so on. And then together with a CFD model of the new bike, we put them on that new bike and we said, well, this was your old posture, this should be your new posture. And here it's maybe not so clear, we wanted to have the arms more level. And, uh, but in this, guy, uh, this case, come on, yeah, for the, for the girl it's clear, she, her arms are pretty down and from the CFD calculation, there was a bad position also. So we gave her some more room and then she's able to do her arms like this. We checked, are you still able to do the, the same amount of power and so on in this posture? And then around that posture, we build a new bike. We said, well, oh, apparently she needs a bike with that, that frame size and he needs that frame size. The second thing we did, we questioned them on handling and stability about steer stiffness. Eh? Is the bike very nervous or is it very stable? Uh, we got different answers and then we, we used that in our model again to predict what the steer stiffness would be and, and we changed the, the front geometry according to what the rider wanted. We had a test case which, which clearly showed that, that our, our systems are working and then finally, we, uh, and this is steer stiffness behavior, so uh, the, the, the vertical axis is steer stiffness, uh, this axis is forward speed and this axis is the frequency by which you are steering, so this is like a uh, sort of a Bode plot or, uh, but you see this, this was a original bike and this was a, uh, oh yeah, this lady had two bikes. She had a Goga bike and a Look bike. And this was for the road, I guess. And, oh, I don't know the details anymore. But anyway, she had two different bikes and she said, well, this one is very stable. This is very nervous at, at, at slow speed. And our, our method also predicted that at slow speed, it was very, very, the steer stiffness was very low, so very hard to control. So we used those things. Finally, the design was something like this, that it's all very straight. Eh? If you compare it to the older one, it was uh, all very curved. It, the CFD told us everything should be straight and, and then with the arms also being straight, this new posture. And those are then the new bikes for the Tokyo 2020, by which we hope to win. Questions? A lot of material. Uh, can you buy the bike? Yes, you can. That's the regulations. How much does it cost? A lot. <laughs> I think commercially you have to build like 30 bikes, otherwise it should be commercially available. Like, uh, like cars? Uh, a little bit less. <laughs> I think they ask like 20 or 30 thousand. Like a crazy, crazy number. But it's within the rules of the UIC. And it's interesting, building also that bike, you're not free to put the hands or your feet or your, your buttock everywhere. The rules of the UIC are very strict. So it was a real puzzle to, to, to fit everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had to, to give in a little bit on some of the aspects. Some, some of the bikes became 
well, we wanted to make them longer, but it was not possible. Or sometimes we wanted to put the hands far forward, and that was not possible. So we had to make the frame a little bit longer. And no. One of the big advantages about if we talk applications, it's of course very nice for consumer industry to make bikes such that you have less death in traffic. I mean, one more less person died is already an enormous gain, of course. Uh, the other side, the sports, that is such a nice area to work in because you cannot buy a gold medal. Money doesn't buy a gold medal. You can only win a gold medal. So the I, gold medals are, are like something mythical. And that, that is, I think that is the beauty of working in sports. Yeah. What next? What is going to be doing next? What are the next projects? Yeah, uh, some things I'm not at liberty to talk about because that's with a professional Sunweb team. So, yeah, I, I cannot talk publicly about that. Yeah, you know, I think it's your right to talk about it because you're twisting inside the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, YouTube is, I don't think I've many people. <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's true. But, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, maybe to connect to that, these are not short products we do with this, uh, like this Sunweb team. It's before we, we did this, uh, we had like an agreement for a long time relationship. We said, okay, uh, let's do uh, three or four years of collaborative research together. And you need, re you really need that because of the non-disclosure things and so on. And you have to really say, okay, we're now partners and we're going to do it together. Yeah. There's a big disadvantage, of course, and that is I cannot publish on this. And uh, when I publish on this, it's like really old news. So. And that's a bit the disadvantage. Okay. Anything else? Is there any of those uh, bikes Yes. Uh, we had a small test with a, a limited set of uh, test persons. Um, and uh, so we did it twice. Actually, once once at a show where there were just an audience, and we said, "Well, you please write," and we explained, and then, and that's where the fifty percent came out. Like fifty percent liked the system, said, "Oh yeah, that's nice," and the other fifty percent said, "Oh, this is a strange bike. It's doing all kinds of things." So uh, the human acceptance side is a problem, and we have a, in a, starting in a few weeks a project where a student is going to look at. Um, different control strategies, uh, uh, do they have a better acceptance for the rider, yes or no. Yeah. It, is, it is strange because you, uh, in your mind you would think, okay, so this bike balance itself, how do I go about the corner? Because that is actually bringing yourself out of balance. So then the bike sort of wants to bring you back to balance and, and how does it feel? But actually, it's pretty okay, Not, no real problem. Yeah, you would love it. Better than a tricycle. Yeah. And are you then referring to the? Yeah, but you're referring to the new track bicycle. Yeah. Um, well, the idea of having two triangles it, uh, turns out to be a very lightweight, uh, one of the best lightweights to, to construct a bike. So you're sort of stuck with the uh, two triangles. And then where every part is, is very regulated by the UIC. So by the... Uh, uh, this committee, and so the wheelbase can within these bounds, and the seat in, relative to the rear must be here, the pedals, so it's so strict that in the end the only thing which can come out of it is something like this. So you cannot come with a very strange design here. That's impossible because of the rules. We did look at very strange design bikes, but from the perspective of self-stability, for instance, we were able to build a bicycle with rear wheel steering. Now. Uh, Rear wheel steering is very strange. Uh, if you back up your car, you feel, ooh, this is, uh, 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 
feels very unstable. And also people, for the first time, are doing these forklift trucks, right? They have trouble. Uh, so you would get the idea, oh, rear-wheel steering is not very stable. We were able to build a machine, a bicycle, two wheels, and a steering assembly with rear-wheel steering, which is self-stable. So what I said in the beginning, this whole family of bikes, these 25 parameters, is very rich. They're all, all kinds of designs. And I don't want to propose that the bike we built with the rear-wheel steering is a better bike. No, it's just to prove a point. Because like with in recumbent bikes, out of design, sometimes they say, well, it's better to have the a front drive and then decouple the front drive from the from the steering, so we put rear steering and so some in some cases you want to have an out of the ordinary design. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Laura. Yeah, you're welcome. So next Monday let's discuss about the midterm exam. Those of you that are planning to do the exam in 